that's a good time for you to be coming on. It's NBA Finals time. Yeah, we're just starting the pregame, huh? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Um, cool. So yeah, like before we, you know, always always want to talk about uh, hoops and stuff, but I want to also talk about music because I know you got a lot of that going going on right now. You got a new album kind of working right now. Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> unfortunately yeah <laughs> uh have we, have we started yeah yeah I'm gonna, okay I'm, it's very conversational we're just rolling with it right on uh yeah i just finished one cool uh, so i just mastered it so now that's the fun part of trying to figure out sorry my cat that's all good i got my dog sitting on my feet right now so right on yeah so now comes the the not as fun part i guess trying to figure out what to do with it for sure and yeah. I would, is it safe to say this is just solo album, right? Margot is kind of yeah, settled. For sure. I think by the end of it, Margot was a kind of a collective. So it's yeah. like the differentiating factor is that it seems to be that the people that I do these with now are more or less the same ish kind of group of people in Los Angeles. Cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. Maybe I could put out a. I should just maybe call it Margo again to sell a few more of them, but <laughs> how are um, you uh how are you feeling about the the new songs you got? But is there a is there a I guess a a sound that you've kind of gone for that's a little different or anything? Hmm. Well that's a good question. I haven't <laughs> talked about myself in a long time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I I wasn't planning on making a record. I was doing some other stuff and I went to Chicago for some, uh, for like a week of ketamine injections for some like lingering kind of pain I've had from this, this illness I had a few years ago. And mm. I came home and it just sort of happened. A bunch of them came out and I tried not to, I kind of tried to do it a little bit like a, a couple of those Margo ones where I just tried to go really fast. Yeah. And the last few records I've made have been very much the opposite. Very long writing process, very sort of long recording process. And this time I tried to just kind of go go as fast as I could. So it must probably change it somehow. I don't know. Cool. Yeah. Did uh did, songs. What was yeah. that? Like shorter songs, not like the last record I made is like all the songs were like six minutes long or something. Yeah. This time around, a little shorter. Cool. Was a lot of the kind of writing, was that a little back and forth? Because I know you released the kind of rearrangements of some some previous songs during <laughs> quarantine. Was that kind of the songwriting interweaved during that time? Or was it like it was a sh really short time where you did this new album? It was a really short time after that. So I I'd spent, um, those were done just to kind of have something to do during quarantine. Yeah. And also maybe it was an idea I'd had for a while that like maybe there was some more meat on the bones of some of the songs or um so no, this was after that, but I'd spent I'd spent a year sort of doing other things. Um I helped my partner like adapt a book. I'd been working on my house. Nice. Um so yeah, I didn't really have any I didn't think about writing songs really for a minute. And it was the first time in my life that had been the case. Uh, but then it happened and it was kind of unfortunate. Sure. And I just spent a year making these two records of reimagined songs and they, it doesn't cost any less to reimagine than it does to make new ones. So I'd been like, I I'd spent the money to make two records and all of a sudden it was like, oh shit, you know, I have to find the money to make another one. Right. So. Yeah, not to complain about the money. <laughs> totally understandable. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and with those those tracks from the uh, the quarantine songs, I saw in the video. My my buddy Jake actually edited that one for you. Jake Carlson. Yeah, he's your friend. Uh huh. Jake's a wild man. I love him a lot. He's he's an interesting dude. He's the greatest. I've known I don't know how, I've known Jake for a long time, and he's I'm a little younger than people think I am, but Jake is. A lot younger than me so i must have known him since he was a kid and i'm trying he must have come through my friend ronnie who's a chicago guy mm -hmm. 
Are you Chicago? I am Chicago. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Where are you kind of based out of right now? I'm in Indiana right now, but I'm usually, I did live in Chicago for many years. Right. Um, and I've spent many years on either coast. Cool. Right now, I'm sort of parked in the Midwest. Did you grow up in Indiana? I did. Um, yeah, and then I, I, I sort of, sort of lived in New York for a long time when Mario was first going, or at least when mm -hmm. we were on tour, I was there. And then, um, around the time my daughter was was about to be born. We moved to Chicago and we were there until she was, I guess I was there like four years, four and a half yeah. years. But not crazy long, but. Cool. Yeah. So uh, growing up in Indiana, did, did that make you a Pacers fan or no? <laughs> I wasn't a Pacers fan, but I was also that generation. That, like I say that like I was a little weirded out. I never liked being in a crowd and cheering for the same thing as the rest of the crowd. Mm -hmm. But I was also like, everybody else i was, love jordan so it's like yeah. a contra that's a bit of a contradiction but yeah i came up with that era where like if you weren't a big jordan fan as a kid you were trying real hard <laughs> uh, but i went to you know i obviously have very vivid memories of those pacers teams and those playoffs and definitely the rick smith shot and everything else. <laughs> reggie miller going back and forth with uh spike lee Oh, of course. And I, when I, I, I've talked to so many people about this, it's like there's a strange love that New York, maybe it's not there anymore, but when I'd go to New York when I was young, I'd be trying to find my way around. And if, if people found out where you're from, they were real into you. <laughs> it's a great New York thing. Like they didn't hold it against you. They were kind of like, hell yeah, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, I lived in Brooklyn for three years. So I totally understand uh, that. Yeah, I don't know if it's the case anymore, but. They, they seem to have an affection for the Hoosiers back when I was younger. Definitely. Cool. Um, I mean, I have to ask, uh, tell me about the song Arvita Savonis. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, as you know, his son was recently traded away from our Pacers. Uh, a trade that I have no understanding of it whatsoever. I think it makes sense now. I kind of get it, but I I was with you for a while. Um, that song just came during a period where I think I was. I remember our band catching a lot of shit and like. I think it was partly because where we were from, it was partly because we were on a major label, even though mm -hmm. we, were, we were there because the president of B2 had gone there and we really liked him, but. I, so I think I had a period of just like, I just want to write whatever I want to write. I don't care. Not that I ever wasn't like that, but sure. I just made a record too where it was like, if I like basketball, I should write a song about basketball, which now seems a little dumb. No way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I just thought he was, a, you know, was and is one of the most unique and strange NBA players in history. Obviously, he didn't come over here until well after his prime supposedly although i didn't i wasn't able to see him play overseas but um i always liked those nba players that were odd odd balls i guess even when i was young totally and i know they played uh the trailblazers reached out years ago and want, they played it i know they played it at the arena <laughs> i've done awesome. interviews with like lithuanian magazines that yeah like, just in awe that somebody in the states would write a song about arvidas um i mean valid <laughs> right it's strange to me too and i did it it's uh, uh there's few songs i feel like that are like you know some people will title a song after something but not mention it at all but right. it's actually about the player i know it's there's another him. there's another have you i don't know if you've ever listened to mj lenderman he's he's a younger guy right now but he has a song called the hangover game which is literally about Michael Jordan's flu game that he thinks it was just a hangover. Oh, right. Yeah, I don't know that that, that uh, songwriter, but that's I encourage anyone to write about classic <laughs> players or games. Uh, yeah, it's kind of in vogue now for everybody to think that was a he was drunk the night before, which right. I don't know. Ever since uh, was, uh, Last Dance theory. came out, people doubted it. And why is that? Just because he's drinking all through the interviews and all that, I guess. 
Probably. But all the guys are like that now. They're all even like LeBron and those guys. You see this big renaissance of like they're all winos. Oh, they're all so into wine. They're like to, but it's like this cover for me, and I love it. I have no problem with it. I like to, I know how to party, but yeah. You can tell like deep down these guys have like they're just kind of towards the end of the career and it's like I'm just gonna kind of be a wino. <laughs> and yeah, uh, Dwayne Wade has a winery, I think. I thought that a couple of those guys were in that thing. It used to be maybe tequila's more for like entertainers, yeah, like rappers or singers or something, and the basketball players are into the wine <laughs> wineries or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, you don't ever see like a a limited edition IPA from a NBA player. <laughs> you don't. I guess it's like wine has a connotation, I guess, of like you don't put on a bunch of weight or like stay up all night gambling when you're <laughs> drinking wine, even though I'm sure people do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I were if I were an NBA player, that that might be a nice double IPA that was real skunky. Yeah, I feel like there's just uh, there's ripe with with names they can come up with that it's, and I sure as hell would drink it. You get some solid artwork on there too. Oh, for sure. And then you read about um, it's not a basketball player, but I read the greatest pro. You know, so many profiles now are so terrible because no one wants to say anything that could get them into trouble. There's this great one about Coppola recently, and I don't know if it was right or something. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever read. It was about he's using his winery as collateral to make this insanely expensive movie he's wanted to make his whole life. And, he, and he's, so he's, they talk about, I don't know enough about wine, but he's got, he basically pioneered these underground cities where the barrels are, not barrels, I guess that's whiskey, but like whatever the fuck you make wine. Right. Instead of finding all this space above ground, they've built like, they have these tractors underground. They're like this whole city for his winery which almost seems like the premise of his that, that should be the movie maybe yeah maybe that's what he's making the movie about yeah that'd be cool <laughs> he's gonna be making a movie about how to make a new winery when they repossess his <laughs> um so other than i know you, you you said when i when i first reached out to you you don't really have a team um are there players you kind of gravitate to I hit the wrong button. Um, here and there, I mean, much more when I was younger. I think the last couple of years, I fallen off, for the longest time. I got league pass from some guy at the Hawks, and I wish I could remember his name. He was a fan of my band, and so I would just kind of overindulge for years because I never had cable growing up. It was like the NBA and NBC, and maybe you had like a you know, towards the end of the season, I guess you'd have games on Sunday afternoon. Sure. But maybe I just did too much of it because for, for the last couple of years, I haven't watched as much during the regular season. Yeah. And part of it's maybe overindulging, but part of it's also like LeBron's kind of my age. Like he's like exactly my age. He's sort of the last one of like the players from when I was really young and, I, and it was like all I cared about. Right. And so now... I, it, it does take kind of the playoffs for me to be to catch up with some of the guys and like like it's I watch Jaw during the season, people like that. There are people I watch during the, the year. And you watch someone like him because A, he's amazing, but B, you get such like Derek Rose paranoia watching that guy. It's like he's gonna snap in half. I he's definitely feel open. that. Yeah, and it's terrible, but it's just bound to happen. Yeah. just the way he plays so you hope that like man if i could get four or five years of watching this guy he could get paid and could have a little playoff success because that derrick rose thing it's still just the ultimate bummer I and i mean i remember watching it live and just knowing like well that's that you know yeah as, um, as a bulls fan that lives that lives in my oh, brain forever and i was i loved watching that guy play you know and you think of these guys with you know you know and beats the opposite end where it's like, mm -hmm. that's going to be over any minute too. But for a different reason, you know, it's going right. to be his feet or it's going to be his knees. But with or Zion, oof. Or Zion, yeah. Any of those guys where it's like, man, in a perfect world, you could just get a few years, not to be selfish about it because they're people, but 
with Ja, it's a whole a flip side where it's like, I guess there are precedents for like Dwayne Wade sort of played like that and lasted right. a little longer than most guys who play like that. But when that ended, it ended quick too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's guys like that that I, I would be so upset as I am didn't have half decade of what he seems like he could be because man it's like so fun to watch that guy play i agree but it's it some, does seem some like guys not, it just feels like you're just not explosive it. for your own good and just bodies are weird you know i mean i i played growing up and i had this weird little three-month stretch where i could dunk Ooh. and it you know i could always almost dunk and then i had a three-month stretch where i could dunk Damn. And I tore my ankle in half and never had, you know, I was 16 years old. I should yeah. be able to regenerate, but just never could happen again. I could grab a limb and pull myself up, but I was never getting close to it. So the fact that any of these guys, you know, in their mid twenties and early thirties can have serious, I mean, my ankle injury was a serious injury, but it's not like tearing your ACL sure. or something, you know? Uh, and the fact that you got guys now that are, tearing their achilles and yeah. coming back and looking like close to what in, they were in less than a year like kevin durant like bl that blows my mind the durant thing's weird though because he seemed like he was going to be the ultimate example of someone who beat that injury and all of a sudden it feels like maybe that was a blip maybe he's I a think... great shooter but he does not get past people the way he was he's always going to be seven foot with a jump shot like that yeah but you just started to notice and part of it's that he doesn't have anybody helping him right now but towards the end of that series i was like man maybe some of it might be a fool's goal a little bit because he's such a great shooter and he's so tall right which is obviously something like derrick rose doesn't have those advantages if he loses that step mm -hmm. that's the ball game you know that's yeah. like uh another guy is is russell westbrook like i'm amazed that he one he i think he also had an achilles injury right had a couple i think yeah you definitely had a i think an mcl tear and then an achilles but he is some someone who's like still maintained that explosiveness to to some degree and he's no fun to watch for me now but i've said it before yeah. i've seen two athletes in person where athletically they seemed like they were playing a completely different sport from anybody else in the floor the first one was i went to see I had a birthday party, which maybe the only birthday party I've ever had. And it was, a, it was a Saturday. And our guy from our label was there and the Colts were playing the Patriots the next day. He goes, oh, we're going to go, we're going to go. All right, all right, all right, we'll go. Next morning, I did not want to go. I was not feeling great for obvious reasons. I was ignoring his calls. He just shows up. I got tickets, we're gone. So I peel myself out of bed. More hungover than I've ever been in my life. And great decision it was incredible it was that year they were both undefeated until whatever you know Colts were up the whole game and then starts to shift mm -hmm. and Randy Moss I, I can picture it in my head this day he's he's done he's like caught a couple balls but it's not been anything crazy and they just decide to stop fucking around and Brady pulls back and Randy Moss rises and catches this thing i wish i could pull the game up i'm sure it's still like <laughs> one of his 10 highlights that people and i've never seen a full crowd of people just instantly just like zzz. yeah i've never seen anything like and then after that just the couple things he did was just like that's it my friend was moving out of town and i had these pacers uh courtside connections for a while because nice. i befriended the lakers pr guy who knew david benner who was the pacers pr guy yeah so for a year and a half i was the greatest date in town i'd take my daughter all the time if my friend was moving away to get a job it was at a different college uh i took him i was like let's go see russell westbrook play and that was the second player that yeah. like i've never seen anybody with that kind of like burst it was downhill, 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 downhill. I've seen LeBron a few times in person. I saw Kobe's second to last game at Staples. Like a lot of these guys, they're amazing, but they're like playing at half speed. Yeah. 
they're trapped like lebron's methodical yeah methodical but also like with lebron you can tell he's trying to look cool (laughs) yeah he's sort of playing half speed because it's cooler looking than trying all the time not that he doesn't try sure second greatest player of all time but but russell westbrook was just like yeah never giving up yeah oh my god and just like just four steps quicker than anybody else on the floor now currently that belief in that ability is probably not a great thing for him yeah but time it was incredible to see for sure i mean especially the what was it the the first year he he averaged a triple double this must have been what it was it was right after durant left yeah because i know durant I, I know we were going to see russ durant was not a part of the equation so it either had to have been the first year or the second year that all those other guys were gone I can't remember who won the game I can't remember who else was playing i just remember feeling like this is like art you know like this kind of athleticism is so insane considering the other nine players on the floor are also like the greatest in the world at what they do for sure yeah. there's um there's a conversation I've been I've been having with some some people on on the Instagram page, and it's I, do you do you keep up with like the NBA draft and all that too? I do, but I but I watch so little college. Yeah, now that I, the top four or five picks, I kind of know what's going on. But after that, not really. Of of what you've what you've I guess known. What do you think of Chet Holmgren? That's one that completely escapes me. I have no <laughs> idea who that. I listen to a lot of these podcasts and I do read and it just seems like the opinions are really split between like Dirk and fucking like uh, uh, Frank Kaminsky. Dark <laughs> yeah, yeah. Frank Kaminsky, totally. So I have no idea. It's, Everybody think this draft is really deep, but nobody seems to like anybody that much. Yeah. At the top. It's, it's, it's very difficult to assess because on the one hand I could see if he bulks up, like you know, is he a shooter? Deal. He so he's that he's one of those guys who's like he's six eleven, but he's got handles, so he right. can kind of play anywhere. Um, who was the but, guy on the Hoosiers who everybody it was like supposed to be the number one pick for year for full year before everybody noticed how shitty he was? I'm not uh, sure. He was, center, he was a balding guy even when he was like seventeen. Was it like recently or like maybe a decade ago? He still played or. Up until recently, he still played. God damn it. He had a brother. Uh, never mind. It's going to be Tampa. played for Indiana? Was it, wasn't it? Was Did Cody Zeller play at Indiana? Zeller. Okay. It was Cody Zeller. Yeah, yeah he was pretty played. hyped. Oh, for people kept pretend. It was like the Wiggins thing. Yeah. People kept not believing that they weren't seeing the fulfillment of this projection for a full mm-hmm. year. But they had to admit, like, it ain't happening. You know? Right. Well, on the subject of Wiggins, that's that's one guy that, the 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 career arc of Andrew Wiggins is is, is really fascinating because he was like bust to like come all the way around to be like kind of what we thought we were getting when he got drafted. Sort of, but like yeah, defensively for sure. Yeah. He projected as such a great defender, and that was almost the most shocking thing was like how lackluster defender he was for so long. Right. But then you also realize like who wants to spend 82 games defending on the wolves for eight years or whatever, I guess, you know, yeah. I, I love seeing, I, I text my, my same friend. I was talking about taking to see Russell Westbrook. We text during the games. Cause he's kind of my last basketball. <laughs> friend. And uh, It's all Wiggins. It's just like, Oh, it's so fun to see him. Like just to watch him play defense and to see good things happen for that guy. Totally. I'm not sure why I think that's cool. I mean, he's I one think... of those guys. He almost always wondered if the problem was between his ears, like that. The like the poops IQ just never seemed to be there. I, I feel like there's a do, and it was just weird. And uh, but now he seems really smart on the court. There must be some sort of uh, head games being played when, like, I was traded for to like you know, LeBron traded me, basically. Right. So I, I'm sure there's some sort of messing with your head there but i mean he's he's come around now and he's a great value to that warriors team he is every now and then he still disappears but uh i'm more i'm in the minority where i don't think that warriors team's that good 
Mm. But I do think he's a very, very positive uh, contributor to that team. But I, so, have, you know, I like that team anyway. On that note, uh, how are you feeling about this NBA Finals? I have a vested interest in seeing Stephen Curry fail. Because <laughs> I don't think I have some, I won't say it in public, but I know he's not quite the guy he pretends he is in public. Uh, I think he's just made, he's a shithead in certain ways in his life. And I have certain uh, secondhand experience, <laughs> maybe. But uh, I, it's a weird one. I don't know. I, I, I don't quite understand how Boston's as good as they are either. Yeah. I mean, I mean Al Forford having his moment in the sun. He's incredible. Yeah. And Tatum, like I really, you kind of saw the point in the middle of the season where the computer game started figuring it. Like he seems like this walking, for a guy who used to be just like trying to do Kobe cosplay. He still is. He's now, <laughs> he does for sure. But then there's zones where it becomes like so like computer. Just yeah. every footstep, even more than Harden was. It's just like bam, bump, 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 bump. And for the podcast that won't make sense i'll be bumped. like <laughs> a maze or something where yeah i don't even find them that fun to watch because it seems so it's impressive how like controlled he's become yeah i see i definitely hear you on that i much prefer watching jalen brown or i much prefer watching marcus smart because he's fun to i watch like on watching defense. flawed basketball players i yeah. always have and the more guys figure out the thing I find the most amazing isn't the threes. It's the fucking footwork now. It's like, yeah. it's ballerina stuff, you know? And you could spend the whole game just watching these guys feet and realize like how far it's come. That's why Embiid uh, always blows my mind watching him work in the post. Absolutely. You know, and Shaq had some of that, but he was such an outlier for a yeah. guy that size who could dance around like that. And now it's, I guess it's like anything people can you can study youtube videos your whole life exactly how to shoot exactly how to move your feet right i do miss the jason williams of the world who oh, just of course like, up and shoot 30 footers and then get benched the whole fourth quarter and, jamal crawford you know oh yeah and i mean iverson even all these guys whose yeah. game that certainly hasn't aged well as far as how we think about basketball now but you know, I'd be lying if I said those that wasn't a total joy to watch those guys play basketball. Yeah. Me. There's uh, the that thought now that uh, guys like Steph Curry have kind of ruined basketball for like young people the way he plays. Yeah. And I it's like, like, yeah, I guess it, maybe he did. I don't know. Uh, now people want to do the fast break three point shot. <laughs> And I, I'm not totally an old man about that. I, I still yeah. enjoy watching basketball, but I do miss the element of basketball that was a little more of a boxing match, you know, like, and maybe it went too far in that direction to being like an and one mixtape yeah. when Iverson was the most influential player. But going back to the last dance or something, to watch Jordan, it just seems like there's less of that, like, Late in games, there still is. There always mm -hmm. will be. And you see it in the All-Star game with the new format. Like, when you change right. the format, you do reintroduce some of that boxing match True. stuff. Um, but I think they're going to have – I think it would be cool if they really changed the game a lot. To It's like anything. Once the computer figures out the simulation, yeah. you change it, you know? It was so fun. I'm, the All-Star game is such a non-event, but it's been so fun to watch. What do they call that rule? At the end of the game, it becomes like the first one to eleven or whatever. Well, I know it's like they're do basically there's like was it four mini games? Yeah, and there's like the, the guy who developed that rule. It's named after him. I my brain's not doesn't hold that much information, but um, I thought it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard when I heard about it. But then I watched it and it was incredible. Yeah, it becomes a pickup game. Right. At the end, but in the best way, like with real stakes. And yeah, uh, yeah. The best players need it in their hands at the end of games and you know i don't know i, I, I do think I, they're trying i and i it's being fought for sure by the players because they've introduced that idea in the future of doing like a mid-season tournament 
it just seems hard to imagine what the state like how, all this stuff is cool until like the stakes are meaningless so like the play in tournament i think is a cool wrinkle too but it's also yeah. like you're still watching a nine seed and an eight seed. It's, so it's, it's, like, it's MLB's wild card series, you know? That's why if they do a midseason thing, I almost wish they'd just rip off the NCAA and just make it single elimination because in some ways you've got kind of more bragging rights if you win right. something like that. And you also introduce so much more variance for like, parody which has never been the nba's strong suit until maybe recently uh you know but that's why there's other reasons it's never gonna be as popular as football but part of it is parody you know nobody mm -hmm. wants to see like i don't mind watching the lakers play or whoever but it can't be fun to like really root for a team in ohio or something and know that unless lebron james is born there you're kind of never going to have anything good happen for you really sure. hey man the, that Cavs team looked pretty fun this year though they're really fun yeah but they're also fun because they're so bad all the time that they pick first every few yeah. years and uh the pacers have always been the prime example of like ownership that doesn't really want to spend money doesn't ever want to be too bad so except for that blip where you had the teams that were ended by the brawl Mm -hmm. until then or before then and after then you just are mired in this like 46 wins every year yeah and you do kind of long for someone with vision like hinky or someone to come in and just be like maybe we should just be terrible for two years <laughs> you know like have halliburton and have a couple top three picks and all of a sudden maybe it's like more like okc and less like yeah the Timberwolves or whatever. So, There's a, uh, except unless you're the Kings, or I feel like they just like they tank before they even get in a place to compete. You know, they're like, well, all right, let's like, try again. Terrible management and terrible yeah. owner. And there's all like, you can't feel bad for those teams, right? Really, it's just like, dude, what was the show? Who's the Kings owner, Vivek, or what's his name? Vladi Diva. He's not the I know, owner, he's, but... he was the GM. Yeah, he the, was the GM. The, the Indian fellow. Uh, uh, I don't remember his name. Yeah. But there's a great, uh, I think it, it kind of became like, it, be, their incompetence was such that it became this never-ending loop of all those guys in the draft room. Uh, just Vivek Ranadive, yeah. There you go. They wanted Stauskas so bad. Was yeah. that his name? Yes. And just like 45 minutes of like, everything changes if we get Stauskas. And uh, and I guess you take Bagley over Luca and everything else too. But uh, Yeah, when you have that kind of incompetence, you don't deserve parity. But there's plenty of teams that yeah. are, uh, aren't always 500 just because they're, they're pining for – Stauskas or Bagley over Luca. Yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, the fight. I mean, it, it, interesting to see the other the other end of this because my last episode I had Andrew Doss, who's a Pistons fan. How yeah. uh, how do you re recall the the Malice Greatest Palace? Man, Malice. <laughs> Great. I mean, like I said, I wasn't a Pacers fan. I like the they're fine, but it's just. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to compare it to like a an actual tragedy that happened in the world but, but it, its impact felt like that where it's like i remember being i had this little apartment in broderville it must have been, i was really young it must have been mm -hmm. like right when i lived on my own or whatever and uh maybe i was 20 or 21 because i i was i must have been at a seen a show or at a bar or something so i was old enough to be whatever but i came home right when it started and i just like I had a, nice, a couple drinks and it's like, hell yeah. Just played it on repeat. And uh, I mean, it's, I guess it's terrible for the team. It ended, right. definitely ended like a <laughs> really nice team. It was That's just, just something you couldn't look away from. Ah, it was great. I, I rewound. Uh, uh, God, my brain is being such a weirdo. Uh, Jerome. Uh, Jermaine O'Neal. Jermaine O'Neal, of course. Yeah. Slipping and cold uh -huh. cock. Pudgy kid and uh, 
There was a, it wasn't a 30 for 30, but there was like a Netflix documentary. Because they it. wouldn't let him make it. That was yeah. the story. The NBA would never let him have it. So I knew a couple of people that dealt on that 30 for 30 stuff. And they just like, for years, they begged the NBA and the NBA was not letting the footage yep. be licensed. And that's, that's, um, that's really interesting to hear confirmation because I had, I have mentioned this before that I feel like even not long after it happened, NBA was trying to like remove any clip of that from the internet. Absolutely. So it, insane. I mean, peeps, people could have been killed. Yeah. I mean, you kind of get it. It's like, it's sort of a miracle that nothing truly terrible happened. It's basically a riot. Yeah. Oh, it's a riot. I yeah. mean, there's people in the stands, there's metal chairs being thrown into the exits. There's, I've been to Detroit enough times. We've all been to Detroit. <laughs> people aren't playing around at those games, uh, you know. I'm sure that Pacers fans are no less genteel than they want to be, <laughs> but uh, was was Jalen Rose on that team, or was that right before, right after? It was Reggie Miller's last year. Right. I don't know if Jalen Rose was on. He might have been on the team, but he had that to, was, maybe he was hurt or something. Maybe because that was our test. That was O'Neal. The um, Davis was still right. Yeah. Because we they, played when I was a kid, we played the half halftime at a couple Pacers games, and because my team was like, uh, I guess it was like just good enough to where they would ask, you know, a couple of better teams to go play at halftime, and. I always have this outsized affection for Jalen Rose because we got to use like, we weren't in their locker, but you get, you have to go through like those tunnels and stuff to play. And you're just being ignored by everyone. It's yeah. just powering past you. But the only guy who definitively was not ignoring any of these kids was Jalen Rose. <laughs> who took his minutes to be like, what's up yeah. to every single one of us. You know, I'm gonna try to get out of halftime early to watch you guys. Like just sweet pea. Yeah. And I remember just like, to this day, I don't know. I want good things to happen in his life. I mean, he's really been hustling. He's become like a really great analyst. He has, and I think he's a cool person. He's like yeah. one of the weird guys where you have all these other friends that have weird experiences with him too. Like I had friends that well, we left prom and we were at this restaurant and Jalen was at a table and just like came over and hung out at our prom table for an hour. What just, a good dude. Maybe he's a shithead, but like, <laughs> seemed like a pretty cool guy. Yeah. And someone who wants to be kind to people who are around him i don't know rick smith was, yeah jalen rose was a, a bull for two years one year two years right well he was a weird career too where he seemed like he was nowhere near what he was projected forever and then yeah. larry bird saw something in him and it really took off right and That's those awesome. guys do the outliers those guys who kind of toil away for years and then have this moment where it kind of comes together Definitely. Um, as far as uh, the finals go right now, I, this may be, this is always dangerous recording an episode right before a, a game. What is your prediction? For the game or the series? Let's say series. I mean, I don't know. It seems like all this Golden State is so scary because when it goes right, mathematically it's going right at like a 50 percent more per point clip than anybody yeah. else and boston still feels like i don't understand how they ever score in the half court mm -hmm. but everything i've read says that something like 89 percent of smart money is on boston mm -hmm. so i still think boston but both you know i don't know i watched during the year and saw boston put it together I never saw Golden State look that good to me. And maybe I just didn't see enough of the right games. But I think there's a little bit of fool's gold going on there. Okay. I mean, Draymond can't shoot anymore. I look he really like cannot. Clay. Yeah, and I love Clay. Mm -hmm. He seems like a cool person and a great player. But man, he seems like it's tougher to move around and that's totally understandable. Jordan, Jordan Poole's been really nice, though. Poole's been nice, but has he been lately? Yeah, I guess that's fair. I still also, think when like it comes no down to it, Steph is Steph. Huh? I think when it comes down to it, Steph is Steph, you know? Steph is Steph, but man, 
<laughs> I know, I know. Do you want to say it so bad? No, everybody knows it. Yeah. <laughs> They're all everybody everybody's like that. They're all 20, sure. 30 years. But uh it's just different. Like I prefer the one thing I really respect about Kevin Durant is he's kind of honest about himself. <laughs> he's Except honest to everyone. Of, yeah, and some of that maybe is not great, but like I knew so many Steph Curry's that couldn't shoot as well as him growing up, like a certain kind of religious sort of veneer that's guarding this, this underbelly of maybe not like terrible shit, but very human stuff. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I just know he's going to be in like a Gaither family singing a commercial <laughs> or something. And on the backside, there's going to be some documentary when his wife beats up his car with a golf club. Uh, <laughs> I just did too much. Uh, <laughs> but I love Clay, and right now Clay's dribbling. He just turned it over. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think Boston probably won, but I'm not totally sure why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so I, I did have something uh set aside as a like a little game. Up to you if you want to play it or not, but um I'm it was, doing whatever like you. It, it was the idea of kind of making a band out of players. Like if a player, you know, what instrument would they be? And collectively, like, what, what do they sound like basically? Okay. So it's, it's, it's pretty abstract. Well, I thought but, about it a little bit today because I did read your email about it. So cool. as I put my team bands together, I had a little fear that it was like, uh, you watch Nathan for you, mm -hmm. you know, the episode where he's putting the band together to make the smoke detector real instruments so they can <laughs> shoot them customs free. The more I thought about my band, I was like, oh, I'm totally putting together that Nathan for you band, <laughs> the smoke detector. So I tried to think about like, all right, so how do I unveil it? Because it's not very exciting. Uh, so when I was a kid, my favorite player, and I have no idea why, I just made a decision. I knew I needed a favorite player. It became, it was Alonzo Mourning. Nice. And kind of remained my favorite player. I have no idea why. He doesn't play like the kind of players I resemble or whatever. <laughs> so I have to put him on. He seems like he'd be the drummer. Yeah. He's got he's got the 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 metal wristbands. Absolutely. <laughs> but he also kind of reminds me of that Nathan for you drummer. Okay. Yeah. For some reason. And I can't remember if that guy resembles him or if it's just it's some sort of cosmic uh, whatever. I think there'd be it'd have to be a Beatles situation where there's co co lead singers. Mm-hmm. For me, it would be Iverson, and it would be Steve Nash. Mm, there's some balance in there. Yeah, I think so. But I think they'd have a lot of respect for each other. Yeah. One thing I really appreciate about Alan Iverson is how much he loves basketball and players currently. He seems yeah. like, he like he's got no resentment for a lot of things a lot of ex-players can. He's very he was, nurturing to the game right now. Oh my God, so much in a way that you never would have expected the way he was portrayed, which is probably always highly inaccurate and right. by a lot of very fucked up ways. But uh, so those would be the singers. And then we've got Alonzo Mourning on drums. I think I would put, I'm not sure the name is aged well, but I'd put Jason White Chocolate Williams on keyboards. <laughs> uh, He's got the look. Maybe, yeah. And he might do a vocal every now and then. Yeah. Uh, Ginobili would for sure be the guitar player. Oh, yeah. And then I think uh, Jalen Rose would be the bass player. And that's, that would be the that's pretty, that's pretty well rounded. It's a six piece. There's three goofy white guys. <laughs> There's three very not goofy white guys. And I think their, their attitudes, uh, would complement each other, except for Jason Williams, who would probably cause some friction. I mean, that, that band's not uh, destined to last long. Jason will have his side project while the yeah. first album is charting. <laughs> uh, He'll go off and do his panda bear to the Animal Collective, you know. For sure. Yeah, I don't know enough about... I felt so guilty on a podcast that's about indie rock because I don't feel like I know that much about indie rock, but <laughs> I definitely feel like Jason Williams would become a problem. I don't is there like I a... Is there like a genre or, or a comparable band that you think it would sound like? Oh, man. I don't know bands that well. It's like <laughs> I listen to 
a lot of old country singers and like uh, a lot of old like female pop stuff. And uh, let me think about a band that I would know. Uh, it's a six piece band, so it's probably a more modern band because it seems like that's more of a modern, sure, maybe more of a modern phenomenon. Maybe not. Uh, I mean, six piece with a uh, you know those three white dudes. It really well could be like a baroque pop sort of band, a little uh, obscure. In my head, I keep hearing some sort of kink stuff. Like the Ginobili factor feels very like, and obviously oh, yeah. not Canadian, right? Yeah, but we can just pretend he's not. Pretend <laughs> like from pretend he's French or something. Right. Because then it'd be cool for it to be like a. The Ginobili thing is, I think, where you have to take the identity is like it's um, kind of it's almost like France Gaul kind of thing, like this throwback sort of French pop. Mm-hmm. But Iverson as a co lead singer, <laughs> or like a, I'm not sure yeah, how he that that seventies French uh, like soul band cortex. I guess you could do that, right? That's not crazy. You could no. have this like weird like moppy sort of white European thing yeah. mixed something a little more soulful i absolutely i see no problems with that <laughs> we, we, we should not see any problems with that yeah uh the alonzo morning on drums thing's tough well i guess paul mccartney's drummer is kind of like that you see a lot of those legacy guys going with those like badass big bulky yeah. drums now he's uh, alonzo morning is doing it for the money he's he's it's a job you think yeah yeah i guess you're right He's like, you know, I, he's like, I know I'm good. I'm here to do whatever you need. Totally. But he also probably like didn't join until the first drummer was like done with it. Sure. Yeah. Like who's Paul Simon's drummer? Oh God. I have no Because a lot of his guitar players are like those like African guys he's had with him since Graceland. Right. Yeah. But the drummer, for some reason, I'm not picturing. Paul McCartney's drummer, I picture instantly because he's such a big guy. Uh but Paul Simon's drummer would be an interesting comp because a lot of those guys seem to go out with like real muscular drummers. And those they didn't always have muscular drummers in their heyday. I don't think of Ringo as a particularly like muscular no, drummer. I certainly would not drummer of all time. But, uh, Paul, well, according to this, uh, Paul Simon's drummer is Steve Gadd. Oh. Yeah, so not like that. But, yeah. Uh, hmm. It's interesting to think about. But I see it though. I mean, I feel like honestly the Alonzo Morning as drummer is it's like when when Jay-Z goes on tour and he has like a live band. Like the that kind of drummer. Like he, Does he do that? He, occasionally. That's cool. I, I, I've definitely seen I there was actually uh I don't know if you remember Tony Royster Jr. He was like was a it? child he, Tony Royster Jr. He was like a child a child drummer, like it was like a child prodigy, he was like four years old and he was insane cool. drum solos but then when he was uh like 20 something jay-z had him on tour with him which is really cool that seems like it'd be a cool thing to see with a band yeah definitely other than yeah. you know his his lincoln park uh <laughs> partnership yeah i don't know that music super well but i don't know anything. <laughs> i feel like i'm i'm on kind of a weird island with the music although not to keep this going forever but the the one new thing I do like, there's not only one new thing I like, but you might appreciate this because of your friendship with Jake, who I think has some uh, maybe history with this guy, is my favorite thing I've heard in forever is that Cutworms kid. Dude, yeah, I actually saw Cutworms on Friday. He must not Friday. be a kid. He's a couple years younger yeah. than me, probably. But you I saw, saw him? him on Friday, yeah. Where at? He was at Sleeping Village in Chicago. What is that place? That's pretty new. Uh, probably within Nelson, the last five it? years. No, it's um, Avondale. So it's like uh, on Belmont. That record. Oh, fantastic. I, I don't know if this stuff can happen that much anymore, but my favorite, I, I, there's nothing I like more than slowly falling in love with like a record or a book or a film or something that mm-hmm. I liked. Oh, I first heard that record and it's so long. Yeah. I'll get myself a little out. It's a very long record. But I, I, I remember that kid's demos when he was little. Mm-hmm. Like people around Chicago and even Indiana just been like, oh, there's this weirdo little like Roy Orbison kid. Not Roy Orbison, but I guess like an Everly Brothers kid. But kind of like 
Yeah. Like all those guys. All weirdly. of them. Yeah, exactly. It's like sometimes he's very Bob Dylan. Sometimes he's very Roy Orbison. But it's always so much himself, man. There's yeah. no, it's like, it's not parody and it's not, I, I slowly found myself, oh, here's a song that like I'm putting on a little more than mm-hmm. I was. And before long, that whole record to me is just like a fucking masterpiece. It's yeah. so good. And it's so lean. Mm-hmm. And I like that other one that's like the opposite of lean. I think that one's really cool too. Yeah. And, and no I think luck. he's got some more stuff coming out this year too. Oh man, I hope so. I I don't know how to just that record is so beautiful and so like uh, it's just I don't know, I'm going blank just thinking yeah, about no, it. No, I hear you. And he's it, not he's not playing dress up. He's it's like he's quietly up. charismatic, yeah it's it's the it's that whole gillian welch thing it's like uh-huh. it does not matter when this kid was born right where he was born this shit is in his blood like he has the dna to yeah. do that he's not a fake he's even got character in his face like as a look you know oh and his little his clothes yeah and his, he, had, he came out in like a, a wide-shouldered blazer a little <laughs> bit and, I, and like he had his back turned to the crowd i'm like dude he's doing like an elvis presley thing right now <laughs> It just seems so earned with that guy. There's so many of these people where it's like yeah. you can smell it a mile away. Just oh, like, yeah. oh god, it's record collection rock. <laughs> and there's like nothing I like less than that. And in, unfortunately in Chicago, there was so much of that when I was there. Yeah. Like, in my opinion, really posery, aging terribly record collection rock. But that kid is not that. Mm-hmm. And that little dude, I don't know him. I know Jake seems like he maybe knew him a little bit, but I would I would love to. Very few musicians I would care to have a drink with or shake yeah. their hand or buy them a drink. But I'm sending one his way. I'm never gonna say. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, I, the crowd was so in. Like he has like some diehards. Well, those are his people, right? Yeah. I and mean, he's a Chicago boy. Now he's Brooklyn, like everybody. But sure. He's like he's you guys. He's a person, you know. It seems like right. I, I'm not sure actually. I hadn't heard of him positive. until recently as well. I'm almost positive he's a Chicago kid. Okay. Um, yeah. Great album from also, last year for sure. Oh, so good. And he can't, he just did it the right way where it's like he's just old enough where you can tell he's probably had a lot of, like I started so young. I have a lot of material that it's like me figuring out what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And that guy just seems like he burst, he decided to come out when he was ready. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, I, I, hope he, I hope he's putting out more stuff because fucking love i think it. he has a, a new single that came out i think maybe last i heard that I bought it on Bandcamp. i spent mm-hmm. like i gave him like 15 dollars for it <laughs> nice. so like so much uh-huh uh, you know what he's also doing I, I, again i'll wrap it up but he, he's always like selling gear on instagram like he needs money for rent <laughs> i was like hey that's such a shame if that's true which of course it is because he's good and mm-hmm. not making bullshit. starving artists you know yeah just like he's i'm sure he doesn't you know he's he's always going to be kind of a cult thing he's not yeah. you know maybe a, but he's always posting like you know eight track outboard mixer only used twice i can meet you up at the corner of <laughs> park and whatever in bedstock and i'm always just like god damn of all the times i'm not in new york all the time which i used to be i would just to just spend the money to buy it just so you can hang out (laughs) his rent i don't know i have such an affection for what he's doing yeah yeah not to uh, i shouldn't endorse (laughs) all right uh well obviously yeah i'm a big fan of cutworms and then as far as uh as far as your band goes i I feel like that's a solid roundup and yeah yeah. so i think this is a a good spot to wrap it up so we can get back to watching the, the rest of that game sounds good um but thanks again for joining man this was yeah this was a good i'm sorry time. that we reschedule and uh, oh, all good you were obviously finishing up music and you had stuff going on so yeah yeah um, all good it yeah. made any sense yeah and uh yeah this Give Drake a conversation. for me if you see him i i definitely will i think uh i saw him at cutworms actually god bless him <laughs> he's a good boy yeah all right man thanks again of course i'll talk to you later.